morning. Uh, thanks to all that are here in person and, and uh, those that are dialed in remotely. Uh, I think we've got a pretty good turnout for today's program and we, we very much appreciate everybody's participation. My name is Doug Reeder. I'm the executive chairman and one of the co-founders of Sterling Seacrest Pritchard. Um, for those who don't know us well, we're one of the largest privately held independent insurance brokerages in the southeastern U.S. We work in partnership with our clients and community to provide services, solutions, and support customized to today's dynamic marketplace. Our firm has a client-first philosophy and a robust resource platform delivered by almost 300 professionals across six offices in the southeast. One of our key differentiators has been a deep deep industry verticals with dedicated teams including healthcare, construction, real estate, and hospitality, transportation logistics, nonprofits, and private client risks. We also have a large uh, benefits consulting practice which is industry agnostic so they they basically are you know more of a more of a personnel count than, than an industry per se. We are also broker owned highly unusual in today's marketplace. Most of our competitors are owned by financial uh, owners, either private equity or uh, publicly traded. Um, excuse me. <laughs> well, I'm vibrating, sorry. My phone is vibrating. Um, <laughs> we are also broker owned a common long-term perspective and a commitment to educating and informing our clients, which is manifested in today's program. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today, and I'd like to introduce Philip Siegel. He's going to be my co-presenter. Um, Mr. Siegel is a partner and shareholder with the law firm of Hendricks, Philip Saltzman and Siegel, a very well-known uh, construction and, and labor law firm here in town that we've, we've had a long-standing relationship with. Philip received his law degree from Emory University School of Law after working in the public accounting industry as a state and local tax consultant. He commenced his career as a construction litigation and labor employment attorney uh, subsequently. Mr. Siegel's practice focuses primarily in the areas of labor and employment law, including defense of OSHA citations, contract consulting and construction litigation, including representation of general contractors, subcontractors and suppliers, all on a national basis. Mr. Siegel has also lectured on construction topics to a wide range of groups and associations, and we're very excited to have him here to co-host. Um, Philip and I presented this same program several weeks ago to one of the construction associations in town. It was very well received. It was also very interactive, so we, we welcome the interaction because a lot of that is where the, the real uh, the real meat is uh, in this in this type of uh, program. So please. Uh, People that are here in person, just let us know. And, and the folks who are online, if you go through the chat, Katie's monitoring the chat and she'll let us know if a question comes up and we're happy to entertain those as we go through the material. Um, Philip and I are going to cover the typical insurance requirements in, in a construction contract, which utilizes the AIA contract documents and suggests potential revisions and, and, and practices and, and uh, best practices and protocols you can take back to your business and hopefully help with the administration of, of your insurance program and, and, the, and the subcontractors insurance programs who are working with you. With that, I'll turn over the program to Philip and then I'll step up uh, later in the, in the uh, session. Okay. Thanks, Doug. Appreciate the introduction. Thank you all for being here. Um, so you heard Doug say a lot of my practice um, and my firm has been doing this now for 40 plus years. We're a construction boutique firm and a lot of our practice focuses on the front end of things, addressing risk shifting, through the contract. We do a lot of contract review and what I'm going to be covering here this morning are the more um, the, the key shifting provisions in a construction contract and as Doug noted I'll suggest some revisions. Before I even move to the first slide um, having done this work for quite a while now I know one of the common questions I get is you know how am I going to go about you know effectuating getting changes to the contract because what I'm after with all of this is whether you're the general contractor, prime contractor, contracting with the owner, or, or and I'll, I'll have that situation in some of the contract uh, language I put up there, or the subcontractor contra contracting with the general contractor, I'm trying to get back to a, a level playing field. Um, Doug mentions the AIA contract documents. Those are equitably drafted industry accepted contract documents. 
I'm trying to get us back to that even playing field where we're starting on the low end of you know the seesaw there in terms of what's equitable. Um, one key pointer I don't have on my slides here, but is it's one of the more important points. I apologize for not including in the slides and here I'm back to my question I asked. How am I going to go about getting some of these changes we'll talk to into the contract? Well, and here's the point. You should be conditioning your bidder proposal on the, if you're the general contractor, prime contractor, the current contract document would be for a limited scope, AIA A104. I mean, your bidder proposal should say, uh, this pricing is conditioned on use of the AIA contract document, more specifically the 104. If you're a subcontractor, your bidder proposal would be conditioned on use of the AIA A401. Because a lot of what I'll be showing you over the next several slides is I'm taking a contract language from an owner or a general contractor, and I'm really trying to get us back in, in a nutshell to that AIA where it's a balanced playing field. Um, while I'm on bids and proposals and being the construction attorney in this market today, I can't help but also note going a little off topic, make sure you're also creating caveats for material escalation and material delivery uh, when we're talking about putting together together bids and proposals. Again, whether you're the general contractor or the subcontractor. Okay. Um, moving forward. Okay. So the let, let, I'm going to kick it off with the indemnification provision. It is uh, undoubtedly, uh, from the lawyer's perspective, the most important contract provisions. From yours, perhaps it's the payment terms, uh, but the indemnification is the risk shifting provision in the contract. And you know, what we're trying to do here and, and what the AIA provides, and I'll throw the AIA up there uh, in a, here in a second. We're trying to really limit our liability, as my slide notes, to one, damages that are covered by insurance. Um, typically, your commercial general liability insurance that's covering personal injury and property damage claims. And I'm also looking to make sure our, our liability, whether we're the prime or a sub, is limited to only those damages caused by our negligence. Only those damages caused by our negligence, as opposed to indemnification provisions that may hold you responsible for any claim arising out of your work. And then it may create, if it's going to be consistent with Georgia law, there needs to be an exception for claims due to the sole negligence uh, of the other side, the people you are being asked to indemnify. Um, so that would be in Georgia the most broad, uh, the broadest indemnification provision that you're on the hook for anything arising out of your work unless it's caused 100% by one of the indemnities. So it, it, with language like that, and it's that arising out of language that I'm focusing on, you may not have been at all a cause of the loss, but if the argument could be made arose out of your work, you're on the hook for 100% of it using language like that. Um, let me move. I, mean, I talk about the duty to defend. I'm going to come back to that. I do distinguish where, where the contract mentions the duty to indemnify and the duty to defend. I do have um, a provision that's specific to the duty to defend, and that's because uh, from a practical perspective, I'm willing in order to strike a deal, accept the duty to defend with, with language that allows me to recover some of the attorney's fees that are not my responsibility based on my percentage of fault. I'm willing to take on that duty to defend. I'll come back to that and I'll give you another example of how that has real practical value. So what I've shown, uh, what I'm showing you up on the screen, this comes from the 401, but it's identical. You can switch out the term subcontractor for contractor. Um, this is no different than what would be in the AIA 201 general conditions or that 104 for limited scope. The key here is the language I hide it. I probably should have highlighted a little bit further back because what this indemnification provides, it goes back to the important point I made just a minute ago. We're limiting our liability to what this says in a nutshell is bodily injury, personal injury, and property damage. And then notably, um, you'll see this parenthetical, it accepts out damage uh, to the work itself. Your general liability, and Doug will get into this, your general liability coverage does not cover you know, damage to the work itself. There's uh, in the AIA contract, it kind of works like a puzzle where this uh, other the work damage to the work itself is accepted out of the indemnity clause the insurance provisions in the ai day that, that doug will expand on come in and provide coverage for damage to the work through builder's risk we'll come back to that later so that was one important point we're limited to personal injury and property damage why is that a point i'm hammering your general liability coverage provides that 
there are indemnity provisions that are out there. And I mean, more typical than not, when you get away from AIA or consensus docs, other industry accepted documents that have you on the hook for breach of contract claims through the indemnity provision. And, um, you know, many of the general contractors have that and sophisticated owners have that. And I am all, always questioning that because, you know, what is the purpose of the indemnification provision? It is for when a third party, not a party to the contract, brings a lawsuit or a claim against the indemnities. So let's just say you're a subcontractor, you sign the general contractor subcontract, it has you for all damages, uh, responsible for all damages arising out of the work and for any breach of contract claims. Well, if the general contractor believes you breached the contract, they're, they're just going to, they have the ability to sue you for breach of contract. You don't, the general contractor, if it's the owner and you're the general contractor and the owner's indemnification provision has stuff like indemnification for liens or indemnification for breach of contract, uh, those are, are not for, for an indemnity provision because the general contractor is the entity holding the claim. You know, you, they are going to sue you. You breach the contract, they have a direct claim against you. And a typical construction contract also is going to require you to piggyback on the example I just gave this lien, indemnity for liens. If you're not paying your subs of suppliers, you're likely breaching another provision of the contract and they're going to sue you for breach of contract. Um, and again, you don't have insurance for a typical breach of contract. So this is why I, I, I try to explain to the other side, whether I'm representing a sub or a prime contractor, that, you know, what do you need indemnification for a breach of contract? You're just going to sue me. I want to get to where I know I have insurance coverage. That's why I'm looking to limit it to personal and property damage. Now, back to my highlight, this example I've been running with has that arising out of language, very broad. Here's the key difference. It's the, but only to the extent caused by. There's a huge difference between arising out of and, but only to the extent caused by. And then I make sure we're talking about negligence, uh, negligent acts or negligent omissions, negligence being a trigger for insurance coverage. So uh, in, in this example, if it turns out there is a third party claim who suffered personal injury and property damage, and they're suing the owner or the general contractor, this indemnification claim is gonna be triggered. And if you are 15%, just for example, pulling the number out of thin air, if your negligence was 15% of the cause of this loss, you're paying 15% of the bill because your liability was limited to the extent that claim was caused by your negligence. Now, I've given you two extremes. This is the perfect world for you. You're not going to do better than this. The, the, the broadest example is arising out of your work with only the sole negligence exception because that's what Georgia law requires to have an enforceable indemnity clause. I, I, I hate talking about compromise in these situations, but I understand you may not get all the way here. What is the middle ground between the two? Well, my suggestion would be the next step in a negotiation would be if they have this arising out of language, let's at least say it's got to arise out of our negligence, that there's a negligence trigger. And again, I'm pushing real hard for limiting personal injury and property damage. Um, again, it pains me to offer compromise because in that last example where you're on the hook for claims arising out of your negligence, let's stick with that same 15%. If you're 15% responsible with the arising out of language, 15% negligent, you're paying 100% of the bill. That's the difference between, but only to the extent caused by and arising out of. Um, so it has real financial consequences and and that's where we're trying to go to and that's why i i say it pains me to offer compromise but that's the next fallback okay um these uh what i've got here are provisions that um th this is entirely my language you would be cutting and pasting and, and sticking this in your contract and again you can substitute contractor uh, for subcontractor in the first two examples this last example i don't <laughs> candidly have much luck uh, getting this into a contract it's just the reciprocal indemnification provision you know if, if you get that in give me a holler let me know um but it, it's it you know you, i guess that can be the first thing off the table in any negotiation um but what you have here if you first two inserts there they kind of speak for themselves it's written in plain english i'm not trying to over lawyer it and i'm trying to put language out there that just on its face i mean how could you argue with it i mean is it fair is it reasonable 
I, a, a lot of times, you know, there's a couple of responses. Yeah, it is. We'll include it. And, you know, if you're with that contract that has arising out of your work with only the sole negligence exception, but they accept one of these inserts, you're, you're, you're left thinking, well, wait a minute, that's going to have a conflict within the contract. Here's the thing. If these things go to arbitration or, or in, in a court, um, the arbitrator or the judge or the jury is ultimately after what did the parties truly intend when they contracted and anything added to the contract that is beyond what's boilerplate, the argument goes is more indicative of what the parties truly intended. So this insert on if push comes to shove wins in a dispute resolution process. Um, now, if these are rejected, you know where you stand, um, OK? You, you know you're asked to take on added liability. So let me go back to the very first point I made with you here this morning. Your bid was conditioned on that 401 or the 104. And you're going to go back and you're going to say, well, wait a minute, my price doesn't account for this risk because my bid or proposal was conditioned on you know, limiting my, my liability to only the extent the claim was due to my negligence. So then you're playing with your price and, um, you know, that may be enough to get th this through, at least on the contract that we're dealing with and you can negotiate down the road. Doug. Go back and revisit that point a little bit. Sure. Because strategically, uh, you know, what, what Philip was saying about doing this addendum, strategically, this can be a good way to negotiate out the worst provisions in a contract is, you know, a lot of times it's hard, you know, if you get into a red line exercise and that's very difficult, but I mean, we have seen Philip firm and other good construction lawyers around town kind of perfect this strategy of let's do an exception page. Let's do an addendum where we carve out like the worst provisions and and come up with substitutes. And to his point, that gives you a really good argument in an arbitration or a legal dispute later that that's what everybody intended, even though they're going to obviously argue the other side. No question about it. And you, if you've got an addendum working like that, that you, you can you conclude that with your bidder proposal as well, especially if you're being sent the contract, you know, with the request for proposal, you know, you need to be reviewing that contract, marking it back for sending it back Doug's point with an addendum that addresses key provisions. So the argument can't be made by submitting the bid you accepted the contract as it was drafted. Can, um, can I make one more point? Yeah, go, keep, I don't, keep we it don't coming. cover this. Anybody, I, if you've got practical experience with this, keep it coming. Go ahead. My, my we didn't cover this, so I'm going to raise this because it came up in real life recently. Yeah. And I want to remind everybody that's on this program. Um, we have we advocate for our subcontractors to always get a copy of the GC contract if it's incorporated by reference which it is in like 99.9% .9 of the cases, maybe 100. Um, the reason is you're going to be held to provisions in there. And how can you possibly, uh, you know, be in a position to defend your position if you don't know what the provisions are in that upstream contract? And we had a case recently where one of our subcontractors is is talking to a, a you know a large national GC about doing their first job with them, and they said, "Okay, we want a copy of the owner contract," and they flatly refused to give it to them. They would not send it to them. They said they could come and look at it, a redacted version in their office. I don't know how that's going to work itself out, but we always advocate for getting that contract. You have a right to that if it's incorporated by reference. And if if you want to try and work around that, then we would probably need to make an addendum that basically would say the subcontract's going to prevail and, and we're not going to be bound by that upstream contract. These are all excellent points. Just to piggyback on a couple of them, the, the, this is particularly timely back to, you know, we're, we are talking about risk and uh, risk shifting here on this material availability price volatility issue. You know, what we're finding is, particularly from the subcontractor's perspective, the relief may not be available in that subcontract, but getting that prime contract, there may be relief there that the general contractor has negotiated. So it is particularly timely um, comment in these times. Um, the other point I want to make um, is, and this isn't not part of our slides here, but um, Getting a copy of that contract, that prime contract, one other revision I make, and when we're right, it's usually within the first two paragraphs of a contract. 
Um, the contract documents are defined. This is what Doug's speaking about. It captures the prime contract. And I'm insert when I'm asked to review the contract, we have an insert that just says, it, I'll say it twice, copies of the contract documents shall be provided to subcontractor contractor prior to execution of this contract. Contract documents shall be provided to subcontractor slash contractor prior to execution of the contract. Now, if they're not provided, you, there's a breach of contract uh, when you get that term there. And um, to Doug's other point, if, the, if they're refusing to provide it, uh, we're making a paper trial of that um, because th that sets up the idea that we can't possibly be bound to it. Um, so, and, and again, you may find that the uh, contract upstream also has a more limp indemnity provision, getting back to on point, than the contract you're being asked to sign. So always good to, and you are bound to it. That's, that's the ultimate point. You really ought to have a contract. In fact, that's one, of the, that's one of the surprising things that you may find <laughs> is that when you get that contract, it may be an AIA contract. And I've, I've seen that just as much as oh, yeah. the other where the, the GC and the owner have signed a straight up AIA contract, which is which is fairly, you know, uh, equal and, you know, yet they're holding you to a much more onerous downstream contract. So it would actually give you some negotiation wiggle room probably to make some modifications to get you closer to the AIA. 100%, I've seen it time and time again. Um, okay, so I said I'd come back to the duty to defend. And again, I. And, and trying to reach an agreement on would agree to it. We're again, I'm talking about the indemnity that has us limited to personal injury and property damage because this duty to defend, and we're going to talk about additional insured next, um, would involve your insurance company providing the attorney that responds to these claims. So th this is why I say I, I could break out the duty to defend, but these are also my, uh, th this is also my language. I highlighted here again, I'm noting. Uh, that we're not responsible to the extent that the claim is due to the negligence of others. I said I was going to have another point on how this has practical value. Um, a lot of these claims, these personal injury and property damage claims, as they go through court particularly, um, and even in an instance where the contract calls for arbitration, there'll be a mediation requirement as the case proceeds before its final disposition. And in those instances, having this clause there allows you to a uh, note to the other to, to your co-defendants as it would be uh, that you're defending pursuant to this clause that hey as this goes forward you have incentive to participate with your checkbook in this mediation because if this goes forward and the jury deter or the arbitrator determines that you've got a percentage of responsibility for this claim you are going to be reimbursing me that percentage of the fees and expenses that have been incurred defending the action and in, in, a lot of these cases do get resolved in mediation. Um, and again, it brings that party still to the table as opposed to um, going without this where they're just off to the hills and it's just entirely your problem with your insurance company. Um, so again, these are inserts and, and really I'm not making revisions within the body of the clause that addresses the duty to defend other than the indemnity obligation, which I showed you on the last screen or last two screens. Okay, I mentioned additional insured. This is right behind the indemnification provision in terms of the uh, key risk shifting provisions in a construction contract. And in a nutshell, what the additional insured provision is asking, uh, again, whether you're the contractor contracting with an owner or a sub with a GC, you're being asked to have the party you're contracting with and maybe others um, named as uh, being able to have the same benefits under your insurance policies as you do as, as the key, you know, as the insured who bought the policy. Um, I th That's it in a nutshell. Um, taking a deeper dive, my next bullet point here speaks on this loophole issue, the additional insured loophole. That's the terminology out there. What is that? Well, I just got through explaining to you how we can take a broad indemnity provision and, and get it back to the AIA, limiting it to our liability to the extent the damages are due to our negligence. You may hit that grand slam and get that AIA indemnity provision and you're feeling really good. Well, we get down to the insurance clauses and what you got in the indemnity can be taken away through the additional insured because 
whatever negligence belongs to the indemnities, if you've got a broad additional insured obligation, they're just going to turn to your insurance company and have your insurance company cover that loss or, or the claim, the, their portion of the loss. Um, so similar to what we do with the indemnity provision, we're looking, and I'll, I'll show you my language here on the next slide, we're looking to limit the coverage afforded the additional insureds to only those claims due to our negligence. Um, I highlight when we're going through a construction contract, and, and Doug will talk a little bit more about this, the insurance, the additional insured requirements, the, the point I want to make here on my third bullet point is every once in a while, actually I just saw it again yesterday, there's a requirement that the, the contract actually requires you to use a specific endorsement form. And I'm highlighting here the 2010-1185 endorsement form. Why? Because that's the form that provides the broadest additional insured coverage. It's covering any claim arising out of your work. It's back to that. Without uh, Here in Georgia, it does need to have the sole negligence exception. Um, we do have that same consistency um, on the additional insured issue. But I'll tell you, anytime I see the 2010-1185 requirement in a contract, I'm crossing it out. I don't like to do a lot of deletions. People are really sensitive about their own language, but this one I can't help. The 2010-1185 would cross it out. Um, what, what does that leave us with? Where there's no additional insured endorsement form required by the con, you're left with your standard form. I'll, you'll talk on that, Doug, and what standard forms are out there. But you ought to go back and look and see what your standard form provides. Because if you find that you're using a broad form, the, this language I suggest on the next slide has particular importance. On the other hand, if your contract that you're signing doesn't require a particular form and your endorsement form is limiting, then you wouldn't want to mess with it. Um, the last point I want to make on the insurance requirements, uh, we're going to come to this waiver of subrogation issue uh, that is almost every contract. And, th and that is, um, and Doug will talk a little bit more about this, but you're being asked, well, you know, if your insurance company pays out a claim, it may be that um, other trades on site or maybe the general contractor uh, upstream or the owner um, had responsibility for the loss. Your insurance company would like to stand into your shoes and sue those other responsible parties to recover what it's paid out on the claim. When the insurance company steps into your shoes to do that, that's called a subrogation claim. The waiver of subrogation wants to have your insurance company pay it out and, and then be that's it that the insurance company has no ability to recover its loss other than increasing your premiums every year you know, as your business goes forward. Uh, I'll come back to that, but my general advice is to delete waivers of subrogation. Okay, so what you've got up on your screen here, and, and these are just, again, other than crossing out the 2010-1185 form, I'm really not making any deletions where there's additional insured requirements in a contract. I'm adding these inserts though, and they speak for themselves. Um, and let me offer compromise here. Again, this is intended to apply to the extent you know, here's the to the extent language, and again, you know, negligent acts or omissions. Um, what is compromise if this is going to be rejected? Um, so I'd like to go back in a negotiation and suggest, all right, well, can we distinguish between claims against the other side that are due to their active negligence versus the passive negligence that gets a little technical, but if they did something, if they acted in a manner that caused the loss, if they were actively negligent, they should look to their own insurance company for that. On the other hand, if they're just being called into task here because they hired us, you know, like negligent retention of the subcontract, negligent hiring or something that's passive, not really, you know, actively negligent on the construction site, then in a negotiation, we would accept you know, providing additional insured coverage for claims that are brought against them because of their passive negligence, between distinguishing between passive and active negligence. But again, that's compromise and, you know, the AIA offers no compromise. The AIA, back to where we started, is is offers the language I have up here in, in a different form, but the additional insured coverage under the AIA that's not edited, not revised, makes clear that it, it's only limited to claims that are the result of the um, subcontractor or upstream general contractors negligence. Okay, um, back to the waiver of subrogation. I, I identified what it is. What is acceptable compromise? I, again, I start with deleting it. Um, acceptable compromise, I, you know, is it acceptable? But it, the next step would be 
can we limit the waiver of subrogation to only general liability claims? Why is that? I like to have our, co our company, our clients retain subrogation for workers' comp claims uh, because the workers' comp, if your employees are hurt in their scope of work, performing their duties, that's workers' comp. I haven't noticed, I talked about how it happened yet, you know, but it's gonna be covered. But the key question is how did it happen? If it was caused by another trade on site, you know, that that's where um, you, you want your workers' comp care to be go after the responsible party. The, the other offer in a negotiation would be to ask for reciprocal waivers of subrogation. Uh, you know, candidly, I rarely get that. Um, it's more often if we're negotiating, I'm successful limiting the subrogate waiver of subrogation to general liability claims, retaining subrogation rights for workers' comp claims. Okay. The last uh, risk shifting provision I want to talk about here before I turn this over to Doug deals with damages to work. The, the, these provisions, um, I give you a couple examples. They, the issue arises in contract provisions that basically say you're responsible for your work until it's been accepted by the owner or until final payments been made. And there's no caveat that you have to be on site or that it would have been uh, the damage has to be to a cause within your control. It's just broadly written like that. And um, this is where uh, we are looking to really make sure two key things in, in a clause that's written that broadly. I want to make sure that if our uh, work is damaged by other trades, that we are, uh, there's a means, and in, in, I'm giving you some language right here, that you know, the party upstream could back charge the responsible trade and for the remediate repair remediation, whatever it is. Um, the other issue is, and uh, this will be my um, transition here to Doug, is the, uh, I don't want you guys responsible for um, damages to, damages to your work uh, that are due to causes covered by typical builder's risk policy that um, the entity, typically the owner, should be providing builder's risk, especially for new construction. I'll leave the details to Doug here, but I'll add just one last point. Where there is a, a provision in the contract that already has the party upstream providing builder's risk, it, it's already in the contract. You know there's builder's risk for your work. The question then is, well, what does the contract say about who's responsible for the deductible? And the last practice point I'll leave you with, and I'll be here to answer any questions. It's not up on my slide, but where you're looking at a contract, whether you're the general contractor signing the owner's contract, or you're a subcontractor signing the general contractor's subcontract, and it's got builder's risk, and it says you're gonna be on the hook for the deductible, maybe it looks and says that you're gonna be on the hook for your proportional share of the deductible. Well, some of these deductibles can get in over a hundred excess of $100,000. So here's the language that I look to insert. The deductible shall not exceed $5,000. The deductible shall not exceed $5,000. And then you, you see where it goes. I'm, I'm sure Doug has a lot more to add on that point. Um, again, these are uh, just inserts that make the points I just made in plain English. Again, if these are rejected, you kind of know where you stand and you're back to the point I just made a, a few minutes earlier. Our bid was conditioned on the AIA and uh, consequently our price was two um, and we have to revisit our price. Uh, two other bonus points here and if you're in a negotiation maybe try to keep it on the lower level on the other side as possible. The party that's interested, the person on the other side that really wants to get the project going. Maybe you can say let's do the AIA on this job so we can get going. I got to lock in my pricing on my materials um, and we can negotiate the terms of your contract for the next one. You, you let me know how that works. Happy to answer any questions. Um, and if anything's come over online, Katie, how are we doing? Okay. Well, Doug's got a lot more uh, to expand on here and take a deeper dive, um, and I'll stick around. Thanks for having me. Um, since we, since Philip was talking about builder's risk, I mean, uh, we're going to touch on this later uh, some more. But um, this is another uh, sort of interesting dynamic, you know push and pull in the subcontractor GC relationship. Um, you are an insured under the builder's risk. Uh, in the AIA documents, there are specific rights that you have to get that policy. And um, again, we, we encourage all our subcontractors that are gonna be covered under a builder's risk provided by 
others, either the owner or the GC, to make sure you get a copy of that policy before you start. And certainly, if you don't automatically default to a deductible, I, I really like to get it before you sign your contract, because if you can, because there could be other issues besides the deductible. Um, this coverage is very specifiable, so it's very customizable. It's not an off the shelf product. And so, you know, depending on the facts and circumstances of the project itself, there could be other, uh, you know, things that you might challenge besides the deductible, where there would be sufficient coverage or a sublimit that's not high enough. Um, an example would be these, these policies typically cover material and temporary storage. And prior to an inflationary environment like we're in, you know, a lot of times uh, brokers who put those together will default to sublimits that are a percentage of the total, or, you know, there's just round numbers, 250,000, 500,000. They may not be nearly enough under in today's world where people are buying lots of material and temporarily storing it off the job site. Okay, if it's on the job site, it's covered under the main limit, which as long as the limit is is high enough that it covers the construction value you should be fine but it's it's a situation like that where i can imagine right now temporary storage deals being cut left and right to lock in materials and you may be storing millions of dollars worth of equipment in a warehouse off site that should be covered under that policy if it's not we can help you with that we can point that out we can go out and price coverage ourselves to supplement that if the if the GC is unwilling or the owner are unwilling to modify those. So that's that's particularly important right now because that's a really classic example. The coverage could be deficient and it's it's beyond this deductible responsibility that, that Philip was talking about. So you know that should be on your checklist when you are you know when you are getting ready to crank up a, a, a job um, in addition to getting that upstream contract, um, you want to get the builder's risk policy most of the time, unless you're covering it yourself on, under your own inland marine coverage. Um, so kind of the way I look at this program is we, we sort of call this insurance 101. It's kind of, in, you know, administration of the insurance. Philip talked a lot about the contractual provisions and we're we're involved in those, but that's typically driven by the attorney. And we may, you know, we may consult on some of that, but um, this is this is really sort of the part of the process where we spend a lot of our time, which is basically consulting with clients about what's what they've agreed to already a lot of times, unfortunately, and trying to figure out, you know, are there holes or deficiencies that we need to either price additional limits or, or things like that. Um, but, you know, we're, we're essentially uh, trying to help our clients, you know, with their own insurance and the insurance of others uh, address this contractual risk transfer that's occurring, that's coming through these contracts upstream. Oh, I'll just repeat it. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. She's going to make me do this anyway. So it becomes the property of the owner, GC. You also are insuring that in an offsite, and we provide insurance to show that it's covered. When that material leaves your site to head to a job site, who is the builder's GC's builder's risk policy covering it in in transport, or is that where does that line fall? Uh, the answer is it depends, and this is also one of those just that is a supplement to a builder's risk policy. Typically, there's some built-in limit for a property in transit, um, but you know, again, that may or may not be sufficient to to circumstances today where they're we're dealing with locking up lots of material early in the process because of you know the fear of inflation and that's happening throughout the construction environment right now so this issue is that that's a, a perfect example of a situation where we might say well wait a second this is only two hundred fifty thousand dollars you're you're gonna have more in transit than that we need to either get them to address it through that policy or look at some kind of supplemental inner marine coverage for you directly which can be done, but again, we, we've got to be out in front of this in a, yeah, as early as possible.
then it also gets to the You know, typically, I don't think it's going to be that specific yeah. in the construction contract, but, but I mean, it's going to depend. Like it's pre it, yeah, it, it could be, but I mean, I think typically what, you know, it's that's going to be a separate understanding, like who's responsible. Is it the common carrier or 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 is it the buyer? Um, yeah. Which may not be near enough yeah. with construction materials like steel and um but so so we're what, what i was saying before was we're talking about you know trying to manage your insurance the upstream party's insurance to the extent that there's benefits there for you like in the builder's risk example um you know Basic strategies, all, you know, echoing some of what Philip said. We, you know, we always want to require written contracts. It doesn't matter how small the subcontract is, by the way. That has really nothing to do with the exposure from a from a liability perspective. I mean, people say that all the time. Wow, you know, the contract was fifty thousand dollars. We didn't we didn't need to sign a contract. We didn't need to have all that stuff. I mean, that 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 subcontractor can still do a heck of a lot of you know, uh, property damage and, and uh, bodily injury, uh, even at a $50,000 contract. That really doesn't doesn't make any difference. Uh, we want to have good hold harmless and indemnity provisions. We we want to uh, we want to secure and, and ins ensure that any of that is is backed up by proper insurance. And so typically one of the things that, you know, you're always going to want to track is a certificate of insurance on your counterparty to make sure that number one, it's got the the the, the requirements uh, uh, that are specified either in your subcontract or the upstream contract or both in many cases. Um, and that, you know, it's valid. All the coverages make sense. And we'll get into, we've got, you know, illustrations of this as we go. And why, go ahead. Let, wait for the mic. Thanks. Uh, to add to the last question, everything in with this, um, with the builder's risk versus zone insurance, is there a sublimit or anything for pollution liability with the stored materials? Well, you know, pollution liability is a liability uh, requirement, so that could be that would be something separate from the builder's risk. Typically, I mean, builder's risk is property insurance for the the, the project as it's being constructed. Is is because it's it's also known as course of construction insurance. And we would have debris removal typically. And again, that's another one of those sublimit kind of that depending on the type of construction it is, that may or may not be uh, uh, enough either. Just just to add to that, Doug, uh, on that question, there may be some first party coverage on a builder's risk for like pollution cleanup, but from a liability perspective for a third party, there's likely not going to be anything. Maybe that sheds some light. So, you know, and what we're trying to do by, you know, doing all our due diligence like we've been talking about is we're 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 trying to number one protect our own program, right? If if there's avenues like builders risk that that uh, should appropriately handle, uh, you know, a loss, we want to make sure that you know our documents are lined up and that and that the appropriate coverages are in place so that you know those those exposures are covered in the appropriate place so we're always looking to protect our coverage and particularly when you're sub you know if you're a gc and you're subcontracting or your subcontractor most subcontractors also have subcontractors you know it's basically the 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 risk that you shift to them and insure through their insurance protects your insurance from ever being engaged and we you know obviously want to do that to preserve our pricing and our terms and conditions uh, going forward So this is um, where we sort of get in, involved in the process a lot of times is the folks who are putting together the the, the cost estimates for a project. So we're, we're engaged with the estimators routinely on trying to make sure that, uh, you know, the, the terms and conditions in the, the proposed contract that you're proposed, you know, you're bidding or proposing on 
um, that we meet those. And if we don't, you know, what what do we need to what do we need to do to to make you compliant? So a lot of times that's you know additional limits. Uh, it, it's it's different endorsement forms. Uh, to Phillips' earlier point, that CG 2010-1185. That's that's a that is an endorsement. The 1185 is literally means November 1985. That's the addition date of that endorsement, and it's the broadest one available. It's not very widely used anymore, except on, under controlled uh, conditions. Um, but we're, you know, that's what we're here to help. With. A lot of times, the contract will have specific uh, form numbers and and endorsement additions. But, you know, we would need to make sure that the endorsements that we've purchased uh, on your program are compliant with that. And if not, is it, there's an additional cost. Do we need to push back with the GC to, to make a modification like like Phillips has been talking about? Um, and then, you know, of course, we're also look, we we help most of our clients with their surety bond programs, too. So a lot of times that's a that's something we want to flag uh, early as, as well. Um, we've kind of, is everybody clear on additional insurance? We talked about that earlier. I mean, essentially that is a mechanism whereby when you name somebody additional insured on your program, they're becoming a party to your insurance. They have all the rights and, and the carrier's got all the responsibilities to them, just like they do for you, governed by the documents that trigger that coverage. So the construction contract and the policy itself. Um, primary non-contributory. This is a this is a uh, a hot button. This essentially means um, that your your policy is gonna is gonna basically be exhausted before the upstream party's policy would engage. That's very common. Um, you know, we routinely place that waiver subrogation. We kind of look at that a little differently, probably than Philip does from a practical standpoint. Our our concern is more you know, are there appropriate limits and and is, you know, is our client aware that, you know, there's not going to be an ability to recover on that loss? A lot of times the risk managers that are overseeing construction contracts, they're doing this by design because they want to isolate the loss where the primary responsibility exists and and to and to ensure that loss, you know, fully exhausts through that uh, that scope or that contractor before it would, you know, lead. To, they don't want, they want to avoid counterclaims. And, and that's the other thing that comes out of a subrogation. If you retain the right to subrogate, there's going to be a counterclaim, right? Because there's going to be somebody that's got some small amount of uh, exposure typically. I mean, a construction loss is not always black and white. There's usually a lot of gray and you know, that would open open the project up to counterclaims. And so that's one of the reasons that the carrier and the risk management community have sort of have sort of zeroed in on this as a strategy where waivers of subrogation are, you know, are routinely granted, even though, you know, I, his point is totally valid. Um, we just see in the marketplace from a practical standpoint, that's more often than not the rule. <laughs> And his point is great on workers comp. Um, unfortunately, there's a negative uh, practical uh, outcome of that in Georgia. It's very difficult to subrogate a workers comp loss. It's totally frustrating because we have seen some very large losses caused by at fault autos, for example, where a commercial auto hits one of our autos and they've got plenty of limit. But it's, it's the way the workers comp act is written in Georgia. It's very difficult to get any money back on one unless you litigate it to a uh, ruling and that never happens essentially. But if you work in a regional area and you can avoid giving the workers comp waiver, that's a valid, uh, you know, uh, thing to try and preserve because in other states around Georgia, an auto accident like I'm describing, you would be able to recover that loss and that would be netted out of your EMR. And so, you know, important for you to keep that as low as possible. But again, that's a, one of those things. It's routinely in there. So you'd have to be, you know, sufficiently informed about that in order to make an issue of that and push back. Uh, 
Um, one of the things we spend a lot of times do, doing with clients is, you know, ensuring that uh, what what we what the program that we put in place meets meets what they're being held to. Um, typically, the you know the instrument for that is the uh, is the certificate of insurance. Um, you're all familiar with that. Um, we talked a lot about the builder's risk. Uh, we mentioned the uh, pollution liability. Railroad protectives, another one that comes up. So if you're if you're operating near a railroad, there are special uh, uh, rules and laws that apply and liability requirements. That's not difficult to place that coverage, but you would need additional coverages, which we can help you with, uh, which is a basically a separate uh, liability policy you would put in force to actually protect the railroad from you working in there right away. Um, and then owners and contractor protective, these used to be pretty common when I was a young agent. Uh, you don't see those very much, but that's a separate standalone GL policy. It's basically like a separate set of limits that you would buy that would protect the owner from the construction activities that you would be engaged in. So it's just additional limit to protect the owner. <laughs> This is more common that we're involved in these today. Controlled insurance program, SIPs, OSIPs. You all have probably heard them. You, know, you probably don't like them. They're uh, they're uh, they're troublesome in term from an administrative standpoint. And so we, you know, we insure a lot of some co subcontractors. And I know there's a number of subcontractors in the room. This is this is another area where it's evolved over time there used to be a lot more trap doors in it than there than there are now um, i think that's really a good thing um, because the products evolved and improved and so um, but what we're looking for there is to make sure that there's there's appropriate limits in place because you know these are used a lot of times in multi-family environments where class action lawsuits are common which is one of the reasons that they're used there um, and you know, you want to make sure that if you're participating in those, that that project is going to be excluded from your own insurance program. 99% of the time that you're exclude, you're going to have an exclusion on your policy. So if you're going to do those, we're not, we don't say don't do them. We just say, you know, we need to do our due diligence on this program and make sure it's a quality carrier, make sure it's written with a, a sufficient uh, tail or completed operations period that would cover the statute. That you'd be responsible for typically in georgia that's 10 years most states around the, the south i think 10 years is about the longest there's some that are shorter um, but it generally includes the general liability and and excess and workers comp although they can be done for just the liability or just the workers comp um any questions on any of that i mean And then they spring it on you. <laughs> well, we're we're here to decipher that for you because if you're a party to this, you're an insured in it, you are absolutely owed all the all the particulars behind that program. And you know, we'll help you with that, hopefully. Um and typically, like I said, I mean, most of the time, I mean, these used to have problems. I mean, they used to be short tails, for example, where you'd get in one of these and they'd cover you for three. Well, wait a second, I'm I'm exposed for ten years. Um, that that has changed largely, I think. Um, but you know, there's a, still a lot of this is placed through the excess and surplus lines market, which is the non-regulated insurance environment, and which means buyer beware. So it's particularly important to pay attention to the terms and conditions on these because you're going to be reliant upon them. And if they're not good, you want to take that into account as to whether you, you know, proceed with this contract. I think I covered uh, probably a number of these things. You know, we're looking at the broadness of the coverage, the tail, the limits. We're looking at the quality of the carrier because you're making a 10 year, uh, a 10 year bet on this carrier, right? And, you know, there are some carriers in this environment that sometimes you may, I don't, to necessarily make a 10-year bet on them but uh, those are the kinds of things that we're gonna we're gonna help you decipher talk a little bit more in more detail about the certificates of insurance just a few things to know one is certificate of insurance is good for this moment you view it it's it's uh literally could be uh uh all the coverages could be canceled the next day because the the client didn't pay the bill 
Um, so it's just a snapshot in, in time um, and, and and does not, it's not binding on the insurance company, which is interesting, a lot of people don't know. So when GCs muscle you to put language in their, in their, uh, in the certificate of insurance, and there's very strict regulations about this in the state of Georgia and in most states that are that are basically prescribed by the insurance commissioner. So we're limited about what we can legitimately put in these things, but you'll get GCs that'll press you to put in all kinds of crazy stuff. Well, I can put in whatever the heck I want. It doesn't bind the carrier. Your policy is the governing contract with the carrier. In this agency, we're only put representing what's in the in the program. That's not universally the case out in the world, and we get that. But you know, we we're uh, cognizant of that and honorable to that. Um, you know, other things to be to consider. You know, it's, it doesn't it doesn't tell you if they you know they've got another bad claim. It doesn't it doesn't indicate that these limits are available. In other words, it's just a very uh, surfacey summary of what they. Uh, what they have and hopefully it's legitimate, but there's there's more behind the scenes. Now this is very small print and and uh, you know, but we've got some of these these key uh, items uh, noted in your program. You can probably see it better on your on your uh, your paper copy. <laughs> and we can get you a better copy of this. Um, but Y'all are familiar with this. I mean, basically, we you know we identify the carriers up here, and uh, we've got a note in here. NCCI is not a carrier. Uh, that that goes out a lot. Uh, that doesn't tell you who's coverage. That just means it was forced placed uh, by the sign risk pool. Uh, generally, um, you know, it's got the liability limits here, auto limits here, and there's very specific requirements spelled out here. One of the things we do a lot is when we onboard a client and routinely annually or you know couple, every couple of years look at what you what you're using as a as a governing uh, contract and what your insurance requirements are and then making sure that the the certificate itself you know supports that fully because one of the things that we found from a practical standpoint is having this very specific example that what you would enforce with your counterparty means typically they tear it out and they send it to their agent you know because if, if all you do is put the the legalese description of the insurance we find that that's not very effective because you don't get what you want back most of the time because somebody's making interpretations whereas when the language in the contract is backed up by this very specific example it's it's much more likely that the compliance is is higher and it's also easier for your people inside to say okay this is what they gave me this is what we for where do we have deviations and there's some very specific things that we've got in here that are notorious for uh not coming back correctly an example here is like right here's the workers comp it says are there any uh are there any executive officers excluded from the coverage we always specify an end in that box. And the reason is in small subcontractor situations, it's not uncommon to have an officer of the company out there hanging drywall or doing whatever. And he's he or she's excluded themselves from the comp. They get hurt on our job. They're under us. That, pol that loss runs up to us. And when you specify that letter in there, you know, then you get it back. What happens a lot of times when there are officers excluded, it'll be blank. And everybody, you know, it's like, oh, why is it blank? Because <laughs> they just didn't fill it in. We need them to put in a no. And if the, that's when you generally uncover that, oh, well, you know, there's an excluded officer and he, by the way, he may be working at your job. Um, there's also some very specific endorsements called out in here with endor with uh, addition dates um, that would we would endeavor to make sure that they coordinate with the contract language, which is what Philip was getting at with his remedy and the uh, the loophole back to the 1185. We don't want that super broad endorsement when we've limited the contract language because they're in conflict and the carrier is not a party to the contract. The carrier is a party to the policy. So they're going to be bound by what's in the policy and that's the reason for the the just you know the the issue there 
Yeah, yeah I was just going to say you talked about coordination, but I think it's important to, to mention this, and maybe talk about it a little bit more. It's important that the certificate is backing up the language that the contract is is actually requesting, because depending upon the jurisdiction, we've seen where if the language isn't the same in both the policy and the contract, you can't force the downstream contractor to actually accept the claim and the carrier pay it, depending on the jurisdiction. So it's just important that the, the language matches in both places. Any questions on any of that before I roll forward? I mean, we can, if there's questions offline, we can we can address those. But I mean, basically, like he said, the idea is we want this to, you know, be reflective of what we've specified. And or the upstream party specified. As appropriate. So named insurer, named insurance carriers, we talk about what's shown. Um, you know, they have expiration dates on the program, right? And, you know, many times you're going to you're going to get a renewal in the midst of your construction contract. You want to be out in front of that. A lot of times, a lot of contractors have software programs that are helping to manage that. But you want to be careful about that. Um, there's also uh, a website link where you can validate that somebody's got workers comp in real time with the state, which is not a bad thing when you're cutting checks <laughs> to contractors. Yes, yes. Yeah, that happens. There's insurance companies insuring contractors in this city, in this region that are not licensed all over the Southeast. So, which is part of the reason we wanna see the real carrier named up there so we can, we can do that due diligence. Um, another thing, uh, we always recommend best practices to get a copy of like if you're the upstream party and you're you're getting a this on behalf of a sub and you we recommend you get the additional insured endorsement included we in today's digital world this is no big deal we send it out routinely with certificates for our subs because this is where the meat of the matter is and these endorsements are have gotten very specialized depending on care who the carrier is and how it works and some of them will be conditional so it'll say if it says this you get this if it says that you get that and <laughs> it's not a bad idea to get the a copy of the whole dang policy and if you know if there's a real concern that that's what we recommend i mean it's digital they can email it to you in in two minutes um but yes i mean there's there's a host of exclusions in these in these policies um you know, we certainly don't want any unusual ones, but you know, we're going to expect certain exclusions that are universal across the market. Yes, yes. Um, it, it, it'll say if required by contract, this is what you get. Additional insured, so it won't trigger it, because the insurance company is going to argue against paying that claim. Um, yeah, yeah, that's one of the changes that's evolved. I mean, the the 1185 edition was super simple, and it was super broad. And for the first part of my career, that was very common. But over time, the the carriers, you know, realized this was just beyond their intent in many cases, and it's been narrowed and 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 more specific ever since. I mean, we get a new one of these every couple of years. You know, there's some technical things here about like when you if you've got subcontractors coming on your job site and they're driving vehicles, this would be something super important to be atten pay attention to because depending on what that symbol is, it drives what the coverage is going to is going to do. Um, you know, Umbrella liability, that's been a hot button issue in our industry. It's gotten super expensive in the last two or three years. We are starting to see some moderation there, but um, that's something that's caused a lot of pain in the last two or three years because the price of the stuff has gone through the roof. Georgia is an example of a very difficult lit litigation state. We got lots of, it's hardly a day goes by where you don't see a news article about a large 
uh, liability settlement in Georgia. That's driving some of that uh, in the marketplace across the country, really. Um, we talked about the anybody being excluded, Georgia law versus our, you know a regional footprint. Uh, those are super important. Um, we, we touched on some of these, okay? Um, there's a lot, there's other additional coverages that could be specified in a given contracting situation. Um, you know, you may you may be renting equipment to do this job. That's a first party coverage we can easily place for you. Um, typically, that's not a counterparty concern, uh, other than the rental company wants to make sure you have coverage there so that they're protected. Um, pollution liability, that's becoming very, very common, um, particularly if you're a GC, because I mean, if you do any kind of soil disturbing activities, you know, soil running off into a waterway is considered a pollutant and could be excluded under your general liability policy. And that is an exposure on every construction contract unless it's an interior build out. Um, and then professional liability, if you're in a, if you're in a, uh, a scope of work where you're doing uh, design or you would have professional uh, exposure for making decisions and making selections and specifying equipment and things like that, the, the counterpart is likely going to want to want you to have professional liability. We see that a lot in HVAC. Um, we see it in sprinkler because there's a lot of inherent, you know, design being done in those trades, particularly. Um, that's something, uh, you know, we want to be sure that, you know, we've got covered if there's an exposure. Um, then this just talks about, um, you know, uh, describing the, the, relating it back to the project at hand in terms of the description of operations, making sure we've got the additional insurer and the wa waiver and all that included and uh, as specified. Kind of just uh, cancellation provision. Uh, carrier retains the right to cancel coverage based on a, a notice for non-payment. Otherwise, it's typically going to be a 30-day notice required. Final consideration, I want to make sure that we're agreeing to what we think we're agreeing to. And we strongly recommend, if you're not doing this already, that you have a construction council review every contract. Um, I don't want to speak for Philip, but most of these guys are used to this and they'll have some kind of arrangement, a retainer or something that, you, you know, they'll work with you on so that you're not hesitant to get your contract reviewed. Best practice is that, you know, unless it's the same as the last one that you've already negotiated, that have somebody look at it because these things are constantly changing. Literally, I mean, we go to look when we were asked to look at different GC contracts, we're going to addition dates. Is this the same addition date as the last one we looked at? And, you know, it, they're changing all the time, just like insurance policies. Make sure you're getting certificates. Make sure you're getting the renewal certificate if, it, if the, if the uh, scope runs over. Um, and, and then when in doubt, you know, we or your broker partner are here to help you with this. It's a minefield and, you know, this is what we do. So we're happy to help. Hopefully there was some nuggets in there. I think uh, I think there was some good back and forth. Any any other questions that you all have? Deal. Well, thank you for coming out. Um, we have got another program. Fell. Yeah. Excuse me. I want to thank Philip for joining us today. Uh, it's great great content. Um, be on the lookout for our next program. It's entitled Risk Creep, the Backlog Trap. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, uh, program. I saw it at an AGC conference in January, and it's, it's, it's really cool. The uh, Traveler Surety people are going to present it to us. It's a really cool tool for risk assessing your backlog and, 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 um, you know, there were two there were two contractors that came to the program that thought it, thought it was so impactful that they've integrated it into their business. And both of them were like half a billion dollar career contractors. It's a really cool tool for for being mindful of the kind of risks that you're assuming in your contracts. And you know, uh, 
it's it's frankly simple, but it's also adaptable to different construction scopes. So please be on the lookout for that. I, I think you'd really like it. And I've got uh, I got a PowerPoint on that that I could share with you in advance if you're interested. Um, but they'll, that'll be presented by the Travel Surety people here in Atlanta. So that is on uh, June 23rd. So look on that. Look out for that invitation. Thanks so much.